machine learning hasn't changed in 30 years. So 29 years ago, when uh, I was 14 years old, we were living on a mountain in the middle of nowhere, and I had the opportunity to go to Stanford University and work on machine learning algorithms. And back then, we were using these equations. Uh, the top equation tells you how neurons are connected in an artificial neural network, what we now call deep learning. And the bottom formula tells you how we train one of these systems. It's called the backpropagation algorithm. It's 30 years later, I'm a lot older, and these formulas haven't changed at all. The thing that has changed, of course, is that we have more powerful computers, and they're connected to all this data, including the internet. And I know we all kind of know this story. We're all aware that computers are getting more powerful, but I just kind of want to plot out the future for us all so we can just appreciate together what's about to happen with machine intelligence. So Google today has the total compute capacity equal to about one human brain. So there's about 100 billion neurons in a human brain, and there's about 10 billion transistors in a modern microchip. And being very nice and generous to the neuron, we're going to say that uh, we can use 100,000 fast transistors to do the job of one human neuron. So I, I think that's fairly fair to the neuron. And so if you do out the math, what this means is that it takes a million microchips, and if each microchip costs $1,000, and it costs a billion dollars, to put together a computer, a big computer, with the total compute capacity equal to about one of these, one human brain. So Google has about a million chips in its data centers today. Now, it's getting better. So in 10 years, it gets 100 times better. It's only 10,000 chips and $10 million. And a lot of corporations and governments will have computers like that. And then 20 years from today, in 2036, it's only 100 chips and $100,000. And a lot of small businesses will just have like a Google in the closet. And for example, labs at MIT might have a few of these just to play around with. And then 30 years from today, in the year 2046, it'll be one chip and $1,000. So one personal computer will have the same compute capacity as one person. Now, this is a microchip that uh, we designed at the last startup that I started. And it provides 100 times performance improvement right away. You don't have to wait 10 years. It's just through clever design. It's, to my knowledge, the first computer architecture specifically dedicated to statistical machine learning. And with chips like these, we might be able to take that 30-year timeline and shrink it down to 20 years. So I know that some people will say, well, that's good. That's the hardware. But what's the software? We don't know how to build the software to build a mind. But that's what's so exciting, right? Because now that we're all connected, People from across the world can all collaborate and contribute to the software that's going to run on these more powerful computers. And for one thing, that means that scientists are going to be able to run enough experiments on enough computers that someone is going to write down a causal scientific theory of human consciousness. That's a plan for how to make a thing that stops being a thing and starts having its own experiences. And this theory won't be immediately accepted. In fact, we won't even know which of the theories that are proposed are the right one. That always takes much longer. But this most important theory, this most important scientific theory, perhaps more important than those of Newton, Darwin, and Einstein, will probably be written down in the next 20 years. And I know this might scare some people, but I don't think we need to be scared. We still gaze into the night sky with awe after Newton. And we still walk into the forest with reverence after Darwin. And after we have this theory of consciousness, we will still revel in our own dreams and our own imaginations. We can still do that. It's just that the robots get to do it too. So what about the more immediate future? What is the impact of machine learning going to be on our daily lives in just the next few years? Well, this is a chart thanks to Siobhan Zellis at Bloomberg Beta. And she's compiled a listing of as many of the machine learning startup companies as she could find across many, many different market segments. You can see that almost every sector of the economy is represented here. 
Last year, $2.4 billion was invested by venture capital in machine learning startups alone, and this year it's slated to be more. My star new startup is one of them. So the venture capital bets are being placed, the teams are assembled, the products are being built. Some will succeed, some will fail, but in the end, almost every product that you interact with in a daily life from your car to your toothbrush, is going to in some way incorporate machine learning. I just saw a toothbrush the other day that maps out your mouth and gives you brushing tips. <laughs> so the formula hasn't changed. But with more powerful computers and more data, machine learning seems just poised to take over the world. What can it do? Well, I do think there are some very important limitations to how we're approaching machine learning today. And I think if we can overcome these challenges, we're going to be able to do even more amazing things. And that's what I'm really excited to tell you about today. And I'm going to tell you by showing you some examples and some videos. So this is my friend Dan Paluska uh, on the cover of Wired magazine. And uh, he was the drummer in my band at MIT. And he also um, helped invent the legs for the big dog robot. That's the kind of horse-like robot, and it slips on the ice, and it gets back up, and it's really lifelike, and you can see it on YouTube. But uh, Dan is now an organic farmer living off the grid in Vermont, and I thought that this state of affairs sort of deserved an art project. So this is uh, work that I did with Matt Barr. So on the left here is my friend Dan, and on the right is one single line curved around. It's a Bezier curve. So you can think of it like a hairball, just made out of one long strand of hair, and it's just taped to a sheet of paper. And what I'm about to do with the computer is I'm going to just pinch that hairball at just one little place on the hair, and I'm going to just pull, tease out that one little piece of hair, and I'm just going to move it to a new location, a new random place. And if that move makes the hairball look a little bit more like Dan on the left, then I'm going to keep that move. I'm going to leave that. But if that move makes it look less like Dan, then I'm going to take the move back, probably, and try something else. And I'm going to do this over and over and over again. And after I do this 10 million times, it looks like this. So that's kind of neat. But the reason I'm showing you this is because this is basically how all machine learning works today. Now, there are some technical details. I'll grant you, we don't always use one long curve. Sometimes we use lots of little curves. And after we fit those curves, sometimes we need to use other curves to fit the first curves with layers. And you know, we've got better ways than just randomly to move things around sometimes. But basically, those are engineering enhancements. At the end of the day, the system didn't know anything before it met Dan, before it saw his face. All it was was a curve, a way of moving a curve, and a way of comparing the result to Dan to the target data set. That's it. So is this really enough to build intelligence? Is this how we're going to build the intelligent machines of the future? Just wiggly curves? It's pretty good. It makes a cool picture of Dan. It's powering most of those startups that I showed you. But I do think there's something critically important missing here. And I'd like to explain that to you with another example. So here, this is work that I did with Jake Neely. So here's a new target data set. Instead of Dan's face, let's do something even easier. Let's fit this red curve. Should be real easy. We've got a whole hairball. We can fit a line. So it's easier than a face. But this isn't just any curve. This is data that was collected by Tycho Brahe between the years 1582 and 1600. Every night for 18 years, he went outside and he observed the position of Mars in the night sky. Mars moves around in the sky. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. Sometimes you can't see it at all. By some accounts, Tycho Brahe spent 10% of the GDP of Denmark to build the astronomical instruments that he used to take these observations. And they were more careful, more accurate observations than anyone else had ever achieved before. So accurate, in fact, that they enabled Johannes Kepler to, for the first time, write down a detailed structure of our solar system. Then, as now, data quality was an important issue. So, you could ask yourself, as Johannes Kepler did, what is the structure of the solar system, the architecture, that could be producing a curve like this? How could we fit it? Well, let's call that structure, that architecture, let's call it the story of the solar system. 
So back in Aristotle's day, the sol story of the solar system was different. The Earth was at the center of the solar system. We don't believe that today. Mars went around the Earth. The sun went around the Earth. They went around in circles. And what we can do with that story is we can do hairball-like moves on it. We can kind of, you know, I don't know, pick the diameter of the Earth's orbit or the, uh, Mars's orbit, and we can adjust it. We can pick it up and make a random move. Or we can take the velocity of the sun and give it a little kick. We can adjust it. And you can see that as we adjust the solar system story, the black line that Tycho Brahe should have observed, that's what the story predicts, is different than the red line, which is what Tycho Brahe actually saw. In particular, the black line sort of picks up the fact that Mars goes up and down, but there's little extra wiggles in there, and that's called retrograde motion, and people worried about that. And so Ptolemy came up with a different story. And he said, well, there's an invisible point, and that goes, the Earth's still in the center of the solar system, but there's this invisible point, and that goes around the Earth, and then Mars goes around the invisible point, and there could be more invisible points, and those are called epicycles. And we can do the same thing. We can do hairball moves, so we can change the radii and the velocities, and we can kind of fit it. And you can see it makes a new black wiggly curve. And it looks a little better, maybe. It's got sort of retrograde wiggle motion in it. But let's really measure that. So let's sort of subtract the red line from the black line for both of these stories. Let's call that the error, the difference in the prediction of the story from the observed data, just like we compared the hairball to Dan. Just what's the difference? And you can see in Aristotle's story, the error is going down. And in Ptolemy's story, with epicycles, it doesn't go down. It kind of stays pretty much the same. In fact, Ptolemy's story was not a step forward for science. <sighs> but then something great happens. Copernicus comes along, and he says, let's put the, solar si the sun at the center of the solar system. So now the Earth goes around the sun, Mars goes around the sun, and they're still circular orbits, but if we fit this theory, you can see that the um, curve actually fits better. The error rate decayed very quickly and hit a lower error rate. And then finally, Johannes Kepler comes along, and he says, he uses Tycho Brahe's data, and he says, these aren't circles. These are actually elliptical orbits. They're ovals. And if you use that story and adjust it, then the error rate goes down even faster and gets to an even lower error rate in the end. So if there's one idea that I'd like you to take away from today. It's that stories are important. They're good. These kinds of stories of the solar system or stories that explain any kind of observation in the world, a good story, if it fits the data, will get to a lower error rate, and it'll get there faster with fewer moves, fewer hairball-like moves. A good story, if it's fit, you can play it then forward into the future. So you can ask questions like, where will Mars be in a million years? And you can answer those much more accurately with a story than if you had just a hairball, a wiggly hairball. Third, you can share stories. These astronomers told their stories to each other down through the ages, across time and space, and coming to us. And finally, you can decompose stories, break them apart, and put them together in better ways. So if you notice, Copernicus actually used a lot of Aristotle's story. He still had circles. He still had planets. He just had to rearrange them a little. So stories are going to be a critically important aspect of the future of machine intelligence. But they're not enough. I want to introduce just one new idea before we finish to enable stories to really power the future of machine intelligence. So I'm gonna tell you a little anecdote. So I did my PhD at the MIT Media Lab, and um, just by chance, um, my office was next to Marvin Minsky's office. Marvin is often, often called the father of artificial intelligence. And uh, he'd be there in our common area, just kind of pacing back and forth, uh, thinking about something you didn't want to disturb him. <laughs> And I didn't, but on one occasion, I had just uh, broken up with my girlfriend, and it had been messy and painful, and probably both of our faults. And um, at one point, I asked Marvin, I said, the AIs that we build in the future, are they going to be as self-contradictory and innerly conflicted and difficult to understand and to communicate with as we are? And he stopped pacing, and he 
kind of looked up at me. He said, yes, probably. <laughs> I probably should have known what he was going to say because he had written this book, The Society of the Mind, and in that book, stories kind of compete for dominance in your brain. So like one story says, oh, this body's tired. Let's just go to bed. And another story says, no, we haven't had fun in a while. Let's go out and dance all night. And they sort of bicker it out like a bad couple. But Marvin was also a little bit like Yoda, and whenever he said something, even if he believed it, he'd sort of contain somehow something of the opposite, you know, with an inscrutable smile, as if to say, here's a problem to think about for the rest of your life. <laughs> and that moment did change my life because, ridiculous as it sounds, at that moment, I decided that I wanted us to build artificial intelligence that wouldn't be self-contradictory and innerly conflicted and difficult to understand and difficult to communicate with, as we humans can sometimes be. So, probabilistic stories are going to be a very important part of assistance that we build in the future. And we call, um, in my lab now and in other labs across the world, we're for the first time beginning to build story systems that are not bickering internally. And we do this by attaching probabilities to the stories. A probability is just a number that says how well the story explains the data. It's just that error. And what this means is that the system, instead of believing one story violently to the exclusion of all the other stories, now can maintain multiple stories that peacefully coexist. Because there's no one story that's really 100% true, is there? The Earth doesn't even really go around the sun. The, er the sun a little bit goes around the Earth, right? They both go around each other, around a point in between them, the center of mass. And that's not even a true story, because there's no X marks the spot in the universe everything just goes around everything else. So if there's a second idea I'd like to leave you with today, it's that when we build stories into machine intelligence systems, we should enable them to attach probabilities to their stories. We call our way of doing this Bayesian program learning, and it's already becoming an important new idea in technology and machine learning, and it's also incredibly beautiful mathematically. And interestingly, the very first story that I wrote in our Bayesian program learning system was that art project with Dan and his face. And the reason for that is that today's machine learning and that wiggly hairball don't really have very much story in them. So it turned out to be a four-line program, and it was a really easy way to test out the system. So today's machine learning is actually a special case. It's a subset of a much richer world of longer and more complex stories that these systems will ultimately be able to learn and explain. And I should note that it takes more compute capacity. It's more exp stories are good, but attaching probabilities to stories can be expensive. So exploring 10 stories uh, maybe takes 10 times more computers sometimes than exploring just one. So there's always a temptation when you're building these systems to get them to sort of jump to conclusions instead of uh, considering the alternatives. But considering the alternatives is really important because it builds solid foundations. If the system weighs stories against each other and sometimes returns to earlier stories, readjusting them or reconsidering its beliefs, then the result is more stable and less likely to break. And the systems will behave more like we would like enlightened scientists to behave always balancing ideas. And when they do ultimately speak their minds, they will do so with civility and tell us always how uncertain they are about the idea that they are conveying to us. Probabilistic stories are, I believe, the path to making machines that will someday themselves have ideas worth spreading. I'm at least 80% sure of it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>